Many people who don't know the specifics of pair programming think it's just collaborating while programming. But it's so much more. If you want pair programming to be effective, you should stick to very specific rules. And this video talks about the specifics of the most common style of pair programming. Let's talk about driver navigator. Let's talk about the basic rules first. Pair programming is two people behind one desk working on one computer at the same time. They're looking at the same screen. If you're remote, that means you have some kind of video conferencing software and you have your microphone always off mute and your camera always on because you're continuously speaking to each other. If you are remote, but you're not in a 100% remote job, then I would recommend to do physical on-site pairing once a week or maybe every two weeks. This will really decrease the friction between the two people who collaborate together. Because there's social interaction between humans involved, pair programming for some people can take more energy than working alone. To keep it all to a sustainable pace, to not burn out, I recommend to have a hard limit on the number of hours you pair program per day. And a common practice is to have a hard limit of six hours per day. That is combined total. If you have two sessions with two different people and they're both three hours, then you still reach your hard limit of six hours per day. If you're not that experienced, and with that I mean if you've been pair programming for less than half a year, then I recommend to have a hard limit of three or four hours per day, because you still need to get used to it, and it will probably cost you more energy in the beginning than it will in the future, because it is a skill you need to learn. While pair programming, make sure you split the behavioral changes from the structural changes. That means splitting the features from the refactoring. These must be separate work items, they must be separate commits. The moment you start to sneak in some refactoring while you work on a feature, you add complexity to everything you need to keep in your head. You suddenly make the, the, the interaction with the other person a lot more complex, you have different goals to chase, it will slow you down, and you will probably deliver a lower quality refactoring and a lower quality feature because you're, you're mixing concerns. If you have an idea for refactoring while building a feature, something that's very common, write it down. Take it out and do it later. If you have really small user stories, really small increments, you can do it an hour from now or two hours from now. Maybe worst case, you can do it next day. Split them out. The next rule is to align your working hours on a daily basis. The daily stand-up, if it's the first thing you do in the morning, is a really great meeting to just say, I have my lunch at this time, I have my meetings at this time, so these slots I have available for pairing. Doing this on a daily basis will take a lot of practical friction away and it will take uncertainty away suddenly it's super clear I'm going to work on exactly this story on exactly this time to that time having a high psychological safety is also a very important rule during pair programming you must make sure to attack the code not the person and you have to learn to detach your own self-worth from whatever you produce the code you write is not you it's only something you make this is called the growth mindset and i've made a video about this in the past if you want to learn more about it Let's talk about the driver next. There's one person who is the driver. They are the typist. They are, if you're remote, the only ones sharing screen. And whether you're remote or not, you're the only one who is allowed to touch the keyboard. As a driver, you're thinking out loud. You're continuously speaking what you're thinking so that the navigator knows where you are with your thoughts and how to direct you in a better way. As a driver, you can ask clarifying questions to the navigator if you don't know where to go. This should happen all the time. The navigator can then direct you and give you instructions as to where to go next. When you're more practiced, taking your turn as the driver or the typist allows you a certain mental relaxation because you just follow instructions. You only have to solve for the syntax and the little details, but the bigger picture is being solved by the navigator. A quote I like a lot is that of the driver saying, I have an ID, please take the keyboard. This says for me, if you start to think bigger picture things, this ID that I speak of, then you want to be the navigator. Because if you start to solve both the details and the big picture things as a driver, then your life will become a lot harder. Instead, if you notice you keep going to the big picture thinking, maybe you should I don't know, switch prematurely your roles and become a navigator so you can finish that thought. As a navigator, you must value the driver because the driver allows you to focus on the problem. They allow you to focus on the bigger picture. In programming, the problem is not the syntax we have to type. In programming, the problem is what is the coupling and the, the cohesion and, and what is the separation of concerns? How can we keep our software of quality? How can we keep it maintainable? That is the problem of software engineering. The syntax is a solvable issue. Let's talk about the navigator next. The navigator directs and instructs the driver. They answer questions when they arise. The navigator is responsible for the bigger picture. 
they are responsible for the separation of concerns of the solution that's being implemented. You're responsible for the coupling. You're responsible for thinking about naming and the grander scheme of things. You're not focused on the details. You're not focused on the syntax. That means you think of how to split up the problem into multiple files and classes. What functions are in those classes or modules, how they are coupled together, which function calls which, what is the order of the data flow through the whole solution. It also means you think of the edge cases, what flows through the application have we not taken care of yet, what other formats could this data be. It is really important that you don't micromanage the typist, don't spell out which words to type, which keys to press character by character, that is not what you own. The syntax is owned by the driver, not by the navigator. If you really feel strong about something, you can change it in 10 minutes from now when you become the driver. As a remote navigator, don't side channel. It is really important that you don't fall into this trap and it's really easy to fall into this trap. That means that the driver is sharing their screen and you're looking at that in a full screen mode. As soon as you have other applications open on the side, you are side channeling. Even if you're searching for something on the internet related to what you're doing, you're not paying attention to what's being typed. Searching is also an act of programming. If you need to look up something in, in, in Stack Overflow, you need to ask ChatGPT to format some code in the right way for you or implement an algorithm according to these tests you have given it, then that is a job of the driver. That is also programming. As a navigator, you are there to watch full screen, to think with them, to answer questions and to instruct them. As soon as you start side channeling, your value as a navigator diminishes. Next, switching roles. That is, switching who is driver and who is navigator. There's two important rules to this. You switch every 10 minutes and you take a 10 minute break every 30 minutes. You can decide to switch more or less often, say for example, switching every five minutes or switching every 15 minutes, but you have to be aware of the danger. The longer you go on as a navigator, the greater the chance of losing focus, of side channeling, of having no value anymore as a navigator. You need that mental relaxation period as the driver every 10 minutes or so. I recommend not going longer than 10 minutes before switching. You could go to 15 if that really applies to your situation, but as soon as you start to notice you lose focus, you start side channeling or whatever's going on, immediately lower the time again. It's not a bad thing to go to 10 or 5 minutes. Make sure you decide upfront before you start a two hour pairing session, for example, at what intervals you are going to switch. Is it going to be five minutes? Is it going to be seven or 10? Make sure you set a timer so that you won't forget. Humans are notoriously bad at having a feeling for time. So we need some kind of timer. There are many tools available, but your phone and its timer application will do. You need to set a timer, one that is visible and audible, that you both get the trigger, we need to switch now. And you need to both remember, we really need to switch because the longer we go on, the higher the chance of losing focus. And for the same reason that the rotation time of 10 minutes is important, the break is also important. Actually stand up from your computer, actually go take a walk, do your bio break, refill your water, whatever you need to do, because it gets you into focus. It keeps the whole day at a sustainable pace. On the practical side, you need to do a handover of the code when you switch roles. Whether you're remote or whether you're on location, I recommend to always do a git push. Just commit something, don't care about the message, don't care about the branch name, just push it there and the other person can immediately uh, work further on it. If they're remote, then they need to actually do a git clone, a, a checkout of that branch, and then they can work on that code. But if you're on the same location, then it's simply a matter of switching seats or shoving the laptop to the other person. Once you are done with your feature, I recommend to clean up those commit names, clean up those messages, squash it into one commit, and then get it to the main branch. Having a quick handover of the code via Git is becoming essential, the more pair programming you do. There are tools out there like mob.sh, which is a command line tool to quickly hand over the code. It automatically does the commit work in progress, kind of thing, then push and pull for the other one. It has a timer integrated in there. I highly recommend checking out this tool. Besides switching the roles of driver navigator every 10 minutes, you also need to make sure you switch people. Which two people do you pair together in the team for how long? There are many reasons for this, but the most important one is 
preventing knowledge silos. If you have the same two people working for too long on this one topic, then they will be the only ones owning this. If you have a bigger team, then you want to rotate people into that pair so that you also get so that everybody builds this knowledge and you have shared code ownership. Another argument is that we're all humans and we need variation in our lives. Sometimes that is variation in what work you do and sometimes it's variation in what people you work together with. And then there's even the practical stuff. You know, people get sick, people take vacations, people leave jobs, join teams and whatnot. So how often and when do you rotate which two people form a pair? If you're new to this, which is probably why you're watching this video, I recommend to have two different pairs in a week. So you just split the week in two. Every Monday or whenever your week starts, you have a new pair of two people working together and then halfway the week you switch to another person to work together with and you do the second half of the week with that person. It is common to rotate every two to three days. If you don't know where to start, I recommend doing this. So you start as a fixed pair. Whenever your week starts, you do all work in those two to three days together, whether that's half of one very big user story or 10 tiny user stories, you, you do everything together during that time, you are fixed together, but you do stay within the limits, the hourly limits of the day. If you have a six hour limit because you're a bit more experienced, sure, still the last two hours of your working day, if you have an eight hour working day, are non-paired or a three or four hour limit if you're starting out with pairing. This is one answer, but there are actually different answers and approaches to this question, depending on different factors. If you have a very large team, for example, or you have a very high number of different technologies, maybe you have many microservices with different programming languages, do you want to rotate more or less often in that context? Depending on whether you want everybody to have experience in all the technologies, or you want to have some parts of the team to be more specialized in some things, you might want to do more or less rotation. Code ownership is an argument in itself. Do you have specific people who like a specific type of work or who want to specialize themselves more into something because they are just onboarded and they only know this half of the code yet, but not that. So you want to pair them more on that specific topic of the code base. And the size of the work itself is also an argument. Can you finish multiple work items in those two to three days? Or can you only make some progress on one very big work item? If you rotate pairs, if you're only halfway a large work item, then there's a, a higher cost to onboarding that new person. So all these things are very team specific. And that means that there's no general answer to the question, how often and when do we rotate pairs? But I do recommend if you're just starting out to start with the two to three days and change accordingly, depending on your situation. When you are rotating pairs in the middle of a work item, so that work item is not finished yet, but you're still rotating, one person needs to stay on the task. We call that person the anchor. They need to onboard the next person. If you're starting something new, this doesn't apply. This only applies for work items that aren't finished yet. The anchor is responsible for onboarding the new person onto that work item. You're only an anchor for that work item. If you are just starting out with pair programming or you have been doing it for a while, pair programming should become a topic in every retrospective from now on. And if you're just starting out, I recommend to even organize a few extra ad hoc retrospectives just focused on pair programming so that you can zoom into your process, your collaboration with your, with your team members and you can try and take the frustrations away. Pair programming is a skill that everybody in the team needs to learn. It's not something you're born with. It is a muscle that you need to exercise. The more you practice, the stronger that muscle will become. You probably already have some ideas of where your weak spots are, where you want to improve. But you have to realize that you don't know certain other things, like your blind spots need to be pointed out by others. They're blind spots for a reason. You also don't know what other people think and feel. They have to tell you. And a retro is a perfect place where you can get all that information out on the table and start to improve on your process. If you want to start pair programming, you have some decisions to make. How often do you rotate? Every five, seven or 10 minutes? How do you set a timer? How do you share screen? Do you have Slack and do you start a huddle or do you set up a meeting in Meet, Teams or Zoom and then share a screen? How will you do the git handover? Will you start to use the mob.sh tool immediately? Is your daily standup an effective sync up for pairing? Is it early in the morning? Does it contain everybody who's relevant? Or does it happen late in the afternoon and does it not make sense to discuss pairing for the next day? What if you start to work at different times? And for all these decisions, I recommend you just start small. Use some sane defaults. Stick to 10 minutes, 
pick either mob or set a timer on your phone just just start and gain some experience and then make a more informed decision based on your experience when you've got some experience after a week or two you can start to customize those rules for your team for your specific needs these are some good starting values to just get you started because that's the most important part just get started and that's it I hope this was helpful, I hope you liked it. If you have more questions, please leave a comment and subscribe. I'll try to answer as much as I can. Thank you very much for watching.